Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for for the opportunity to serve, for the opportunity to come here today in fellowship. Um, Father, I pray that you help us prepare our hearts for, for the message today, Father, and even for the worship, Lord. I, I pray that you help us to really mean each and every one of these words that we are going to sing today, Father, and that we are giving you everything in our worship and that that be holy and pleasing to you father like like pleasing incense to you the worship that we're going to give you today father uh, we just want to praise you father and we ask that your presence be here today with us in jesus name we pray amen, amen. i'm just going to ask everybody to stand this morning and you know gina and i we were praying earlier and we really just kind of sense that the Lord has something special for us this morning. And I think it has to do with putting him back in the center of our lives. It's so easy to come here and just sing the worship songs every week. It's so easy to get up in the morning and just do your devotion. But to really put Jesus at the center of your life, at the center of everything, that's difficult. That's hard. And what I want us to do right now is maybe just take a minute just to think, what's an area in your life, in your heart, where something has creeped in and Jesus is not in the first place? Just take a moment to think of that. And I just want us, as we sing this song this morning, I just want us to lay those things down and ask the Lord to come be the king again. Ask him to come be the center.
Let's be the center of your church. And every knee will bow, and every tongue shall confess you. Thank you. 
and oh how we love you you are the week when I was at the gym, the one of the owners, um, his wife came with their little one-year-old, and I'd never seen his daughter before, but as soon as the daughter walked in, he called her name, and she's like, Dad! and she ran towards him and he was the whole time she was there he was swinging her around and it was like it's like he wanted everyone to see his daughter like he was so proud and excited for everyone to see his daughter and I just was smiling because I thought what a picture that is of the father's love for us that that daughter all she had to do was just show up and he was enamored with her and he was so proud and adoring of her and she didn't have to do anything she just was his daughter and as we were praying for the service I just I just had this sense of the father wanting us to come into his presence today with no striving no agenda just in a place of total security in his love and adore adoration for us as his kids so lord i just we as we worship you today and as we put you in the center of our lives i pray that we would enter into this place of rest and security that we would see you as as a good daddy and that we would see ourselves as the the son and daughter and you're twirling us around and and you love us and you want everyone to see us and you you're just so proud of us and we don't have to do anything to earn that it's just we are just your kids lord i pray that all striving would cease lord i pray for that revelation right now in jesus name of how much you love us and that we could just enjoy your presence in Jesus' name.
feel the thing that only God can feel you with. So if it's for you, just accept it. God, I pray that uh, whoever uh, this word is for, they will be able to receive it and to accept themselves. Give them a vision of themselves, of that jar that is beautiful and not useless, which is not empty but full of treasures. Father God, that you are the supplier of our needs, Lord, and that as we give, we give to you, and we give it with a heart of worship and a heart of sacrifice, and I thank you, Father God, that it'll be used to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's read. Bible verse, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27, and it says, well, from 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood, do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And today I want us to focus on this beautiful word of remembrance. What does it mean to remember? What does it mean to um, do something in remembrance? Um, in November 17th, it'll be the um, day of um, democracy for the Republic. And they do this, Czech Republic, and, and they do this in remembrance of um, their own state, where they came from and where they wish to go. And so when we do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ, we think what he has done and who he is. And today I want us to focus on who he is. What is Jesus Christ to you? Is he the center of your life? He is the son of God. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. Through his stripes we were healed, so he is our healer. I want you to close your eyes for a moment and just think of who Jesus Christ is in your life. Thank you that we can take this time to think about what you have done, taking all our sins away. We thank you that you are our healer. We thank you that, Lord, you took all our transgressions away on that cross. You lived a sinful life but only to die for our sins. And for that, we thank you. We also thank you that you are our friend and we can remember you daily. You called us to this life to live a worthy life. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the servers will come and as before wine is over here and juice is over here and when you're ready uh, please come and let's celebrate who Jesus Christ is in our lives.
celebrate that today and every day, Lord, and just as we, you know, talked about earlier, just areas in our lives that we need to re-surrender or, or see you as center, Lord, I pray that that wouldn't just stay in this room this morning, uh, what we laid down, what we cut out, but Father, that it would be something that carries on throughout our week, throughout this month, throughout the rest of this year, Lord, that you would be the center, Lord, and that we could remember what you've done for us. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to enter into a time of prayer and intercession. As uh, you can show the video first. So today, actually last week, was the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And every... Um, just for your information, every Monday uh, online at 3 p.m., I lead with the Harshes a 
online prayer meeting for the persecuted church. And so this is something that I'm very passionate about. And so the day, this day of it's not just a day of prayer. This is actually the month of prayer for the persecuted church. And uh, persecuted Christians are the most persecuted people group in the world. So I have a five-minute video clip to show. And it's actually a, a movie clip from a new movie they just released called Sabina. Sabina is the wife's name of, of Wormbrand that was persecuted in Romania in the communist era. So we're going to watch this video and then I will lead us in the prayer points for North Korea. So if we could all stand and we were going to do as our persecuted brothers and sisters have asked us to do, we're going to pray. And I chose the number one nation that's on the watch list for persecuted ch Christians, which is North Korea. I lift up those um, those places in China that receive North Koreans, these ministries that uh, feed them, like open doors, and um, Lord, the, the difficulties they've had with COVID and doing this ministry. and. Um, so, Father, we, we pray blessing for this ministry as they reach out to North Koreans. We pray for the provision. We pray against COVID. And, Lord, we pray protection for those North Koreans who are escaping, um, even today, through um, very dangerous borders. Protection for their families that stay behind, Lord. And, Father, we... Um, I want to specifically lift up those in prison. And uh, we pray that they would feel our prayers, that they would feel your presence, you would supernaturally strengthen them, and Lord, that their ministries in prison would be fruitful. Even if they're in solitary confinement, that their prayers would change a nation, Lord. And I, I pray that you would reveal yourself in comfort and strengthen them today. I pray that they would know supernaturally that they are not forgotten or abandoned by you or by us. In Jesus' name, amen. I think that's kind of been a message that I felt in the heart is just kind of showing up. And what an honor it does, it shows everybody else that's here and to the Lord. And so I'm so glad that everyone that's made it today made it. John's going to be giving the word, so I'm going to pray for him real quick. Lord, just thank you for John, and I thank you for everything that you have been building into his life. All the, the countless hours that he has poured into reading the word and just living life on this earth. Father, I thank you that you have given him much wisdom, and you've given him so much experience in you. And I thank you that we get to share in that experience. So Lord, I thank you that it's not just his words, but it's your words that speak through him. And Lord, we have open hearts to receive it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So you can see on the overhead here that we're going to be talking about uh, today the rich man. I, uh, last week we talked about the story of the rich man, right, and the shrewd manager. And you keep reading and you go right into the next story. It's the story about a rich man and Lazarus. You probably familiar with this story. Anybody heard this story before? Yeah, it's actually a parable. And <clears throat> it occurred to me that we read these parables and we often identify with the shrewd manager or with poor Lazarus, right? But I felt like Jesus was talking predominantly to unbelieving Jews here, and I think that his main point was talking to uh, these unbelieving Jews that you are the rich man. Can you see yourself in this light? And so I really wanted to focus on that today. And to do that, I'm going to tie in a little bit of last week because I think these two parables are connected and uh, last week, Fiona did a great job of talking, bringing up the point in this, in this earlier parable that the, the rich man made a decision to fire the shrewd manager, right? Not based on his own um, observation, but based on what other people said about him. Sometimes we call that other opinions. 
hearsay, gossip, slander. And he made a decision to fire him. And it, it reminded me that, you know, sometimes we are so busy managing our assets that we don't have time to make relationships. We don't have time to build that kind of relationship where we could sit down with someone and say, tell me about your work. Tell me how it's going. Tell me what you're struggling with. This is what I'm hearing. What, what do you have to say? And that none of that seemed to happen. And the point is that relationships are more important than riches. Amen? So I'm not going to read the whole parable, but I do want to read this one verse. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it's true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Here's the lesson. This used to be my least favorite parable. Now it's my favorite parable because it's pretty obvious. <laughs> Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your earthly possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. And, you know, I wish all parables were this clear. And I wanted to drive home this lesson, okay? And a practical way I thought I could do that I like applications to messages, is what if I were to pass out some money here today? Okay, let's say I were to pass out 100 crown notes, and I would match you for whoever would like to give away your 100 crown note. Okay? So I'm going to pass this around. Okay, and if you are willing to give this away, my hundred crowns and your hundred crowns, you're welcome to take one of my hundred crowns. If not, you can pass it on. Pass it on. So we'll start start over here. So questions? So we have to give away two hundred. You have to give away two hundred. To just pray about it, like it says, pray about it and see where God leads you. Maybe you could remember the lessons that we learned from the parable of the great banquet. Okay? If you don't remember those lessons, go read that parable again. So, don't take 100 crowns unless you're committed to put in your 100 crowns and give it away. And I'd like to hear some testimonies next week about what God did with your with your 200 crowns. Because mine's a gift to you, so you're actually giving away 200 crowns. While you're passing that around, you can look ahead to the next parable here that's on the screen. I'll summarize. Uh, this is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And of course the rich man was rich and Lazarus was poor. He was so poor that he was hanging outside of the rich man's gate, uh, full of, covered with sores, uh, longing for scraps from the rich man's table. Dogs would come and lick his sores. Finally, both of them died, and the rich man somehow, remember this is a parable, it's not a real story, uh, somehow he sees in a far distance Lazarus at the side of Abraham, and he shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity, send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue. I'm in anguish in these flames. Okay. Um, if anybody would like to translate for Yosef, he'd like to know what to do with his 200 crowns. Kelsey said we still have questions. Uh, well, I tell you what, I'll, I'll throw in my 100 for whatever you want to add on top of it. At least 100. Okay? That's up to you. If you want to give more away, that's fine. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay, I'm gonna, I want to tell him myself before I finish with the parable here. 
This is not a parable. This is a true story. This morning, I was, I, I come to Prague by train, and I arrived at the train station, and I'm like heading out the door because I want to catch my tram 15, because it only comes once every 20 minutes. And this homeless man, he was big and drunk and kind of mumbling, um, is walking towards me and trying to get my attention. And you know what I did? I didn't look at him and I just kept moving as fast as I could. I had to catch my tram. Now guess what happens? I get out front, they're working on the tracks, there is no tram 15. I get all the way here, and it's not until I'm in the prayer room that I connect the dots, and the Lord reminds me, you're preaching about the rich man and Lazarus, and you were so, such a hurry that you didn't stop and help this man. And it kind of brought my attention to this idea that he was, Lazarus, I don't know why Jesus added this to the story. He has to say, I mean, it's kind of gross. He's covered with sores. And um, so a couple of things came to me as we were praying. I mean, one was to be compassionate, you probably need to slow down. And I remember that from the parable of the Good Samaritan. To be compassionate, you probably got to slow down. And another thing that occurred to me was... Um, to be compassionate, you probably got to put up with some dirtiness, some uncomfortableness. And, you know, I think about this rich man, and he's got Lazarus outside of his gate, but he's a rich man. He's a busy man. He's an important man. And sometimes to be compassionate, you need to be less important in your own eyes. So let me keep going with the parable. I, I don't have time for the whole thing. I'm just going to summarize that uh, Abraham's talking to him and he's saying, sorry, you can't cross over. And uh, the rich man, which I thought was nice, is thinking about his brothers and asked if, he, if they could be warned. And um, he, wants, he wants Lazarus to go warn his brothers. And, and Abraham says, no, um, that's not possible. And besides, they already have the scriptures, right? They already have Moses and the prophets that warned them. And he says, oh, but if, if a dead man shows up to warn them, then surely they will turn to God and repent. And Abraham says, no, even if someone rises from the dead, they won't believe. And who's Jesus talking about here? Himself. And that's really what happened with the, those unbelieving Jews. <clears throat> I kind of wondered if, based on this parable, if, if the rich man had helped Lazarus, and Lazarus was in heaven, if at that point there's less, something that Lazarus could do for him. I guess, I guess we won't know, but it seems to me that uh, this parable and the parable before it are linked together. In fact, this might even be an example, a negative example, of the first parable, if you're following that. Yeah? And I guess I could ask you, since it's a parable, uh, what would you say are some of the main messages that Jesus is trying to get across in this story? I always say with poetry and parables, don't try to get your theology. But we can get the main message. So what are some main messages that you got from this parable? Do good to people while you have the chance. Someone from this side of the room? Leslie? We'll go out of order. Go ahead. I'm sorry, what? 
Repentance is only for the living. Ouch. Use your money wisely. Be a good steward. This side of the room. Not doing anything can be a sin. Yeah, you might regret that at some point. Not naming anyone in particular. Slow down. Yeah, there's certainly some messages. You know, he's talking to these unbelieving Jews uh, about money, about compassion, and I think even pay attention what your prophets say, the Torah and the prophets, because they testify of me. Jesus says they testify of me. And the disciples are hanging out, and they're also catching these parables. What do you think Jesus wants to get across to his disciples? Doing good is not out of confidence, but out of confidence. Doing good is not out of confidence. Because of the content of who I am. Because of the content of who I am. Is why we do, do do good. Good, yeah. Keep going. I like it when I make you think in church. <laughs> Take courage, brothers. What's happening in this world is uh, not the end. In fact, it's just a short time compared to eternity. Uh, you too might be mistreated, neglected, whatnot. That was a good one. Yeah, I think he's talking about suffering and living with eternity. And you know what? There's going to be rewards. I mean... Lazarus was comforted. It wasn't he was, sh I mean, I don't know what comforted means, but it was probably a good thing. I think Abraham was uh, a metaphor for, for God himself. But as I said earlier, that I, I felt like today that I should focus on this theme of, of the rich men. Or more specifically, this idea that uh, money is temporary and it can even be a hindrance to entering the kingdom of God. And I personally believe that there's uh, a kingdom of God that is here on earth right now that we can partake in and we can miss out on or we can partake in it. And there's a kingdom of God the day that we meet the Lord. So I'll let you think about that. But what I will tell you is Scripture has a lot to say about money. 1 Timothy 3.3 3 says, An elder must be free from the love of money. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, The love of money is the root of all the evils. And Hebrews says that make sure your character is free from the love of money. Yeah. I would say money, I don't know this, but I think this, I think I've heard this, uh, money is the um, most frequent theme that Jesus taught about. Like, I would have guessed it would be faith or prayer, but I wouldn't have picked money. But it must be money because um, money is a big problem. It's a big stumbling block for his kids. Yeah, I think the if you looked at the whole Bible, maybe idolatry is a bigger topic. Um, but number two would probably be money. And it's interesting. So in chapter 16, we start with this parable of a rich man, right, and the manager. And then he jumps to a parable of a rich man and Lazarus. And you go two more chapters in Luke, and guess what you have? 
Huh? A rich man. And this time it's not a made up parable, it's a real life story. Now, wouldn't that be interesting? Are you kind of curious about what that says? Yeah, I, I was, so I looked it up. And I'm going to call, because Shweta looked at me first, on her to read this for us. And it's two slides. Thanks, Pastor. <clears throat> the encounter with the rich man. As Jesus, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What do you call, why do you call me good? And Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these things I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and looked and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven, then come, follow me. And this man fell, face fell, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied. No one who has left home, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields for me, and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields with them, persecutions and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last first great job I, I probably should make mention that I picked Mark 10 versus Luke 18 it's the same story uh, just because this one had a little bit more detail but it's it's the same story if you want to go look in Luke it, it occurred to me right away that this rich man had, I would say, three main misperceptions. And the first one, and I'm not saying this is true of all rich people, but it's certainly true of this real rich man, is he didn't know who Jesus was. Like, Jesus was a good teacher. And so Jesus kind of provokes the issue. Well, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Jesus knows who he is. He's God. But the rich man, he doesn't know that. And until he gets that, he's not going to get much else. You know what I'm saying? How do you surrender your life to a good prophet who's going to die and be buried? But it's easy to surrender your life when you have a revelation that this is the living God incarnate. And he's talking to me. Yeah? So his first issue, his first main thing is he can earn eternal life. Uh, what must I do to be saved? Maybe I should go back one for you. And Jesus really, he breaks him down. It's, it's really amazing how he handles the situation. And he says, you know, he gives the guy a chance to explain um, how wonderful, you know, all the great things he does. So, you know, he's going to tell us that he doesn't commit adultery or murder or stealing or false testimonies. He honors his parents. And, you know, he's been living this way since he was a child. So Jesus takes it one more step further. He asks him a, a positive thing, you know. So are you willing to give away all your possessions to the poor? And what's at the root of that? Surrender. Surrender? Yes. You, you would have to rely on God if you gave up everything. Excellent. Both of those. What's the first commandment? Oh, 
idolatry. The rich man's first God was money. And he couldn't lay down his false God for the real God in front of him. And all of a sudden, everyone's asking, well, how do you get saved? I mean, and the answer is clear, you can't. God has to save you. There's nothing you can do to earn God's favor, God's acceptance, God's mercy, God's compassion, God's life. There's nothing you can do. You have to accept the gift of Jesus. His third mis misperception was, I think, his um, perception of worldly wealth. And if you don't grasp eternity, you can't grasp eternal wealth, eternal rewards, eternal benefits, eternal comforts. And all you have is the power of this worldly wealth. And so I think that earthly riches for him were better than this idea of eternal riches. And, and I don't know that he believes in eternity. And if he doesn't, I don't know that he has faith. And if you don't have faith, can you please God? No. So, <clears throat> the upside down world or the right side up kingdom, usually it's the other way around, we talk about the uh, upside down kingdom and we assume the world is right side up. And I'll give you some scriptures there. I, I wrote an article about it if you want to find it online or find a PCF post. Um, I think it's a good important message for us. We think that we we live in this world and this world defines how it should be uh, but the reality is this world was turned upside down by sin and Jesus has come to turn it right back up on its how it should be and that will continue until he returns again but he will turn this world back upright one person at a time so <clears throat> One of the things I think about is the upside down world is that how big uh, we think these earthly riches are and we think it's such a big deal and we don't even grasp the valuableness of the rewards and the riches that we have in heaven. and. You know, we do all these things on earth, and we, it's like we have something uh, to boast about. But in terms of heaven, uh, there's really nothing to boast about. You know, a great example is the rich man, and he goes, and he meets Abraham. Let's say he meets Father God. Does he have anything to boast about? He was a rich, important man but not in eternity. See what I'm saying? And this rich man in, in this story today, the real story, uh, does he have anything to boast about to Jesus? Even all of his good things that he's done? No. And then we could ask ourselves, when we meet the risen Lord, will we have anything to boast about? Huh? If you want something to boast about, Galatians 6.14 says you can boast about the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.5 says you can boast about your weakness that led you to Christ. You know, having come to an understanding that your life with God is a gift from God, only at that point are you ready to talk about surrender and sacrifice and self-denial 
Jesus says it will be rewarded in this life and the life to come. But you know what? In this life, we cannot outgive God. God is not going to be in our debt, right? But true blessing is not probably going to look like an idol wrapped in a nice present with a bow. It's, it's, it's probably not going to look like a spiritual distraction uh, packaged as personal comfort, right, and joy. Uh, it might look different than something that builds your false identity rather than your true identity in Christ. You know, we have to learn to appreciate what true blessings from God really are. Kingdom life is based on the principle of eternal life. Let me say that again. Kingdom life is based on the principle of eternal life. Worldly life is based on the principle of limitations. Limited time, limited resources, limited wealth. All of these in scarcity, limited commodities. But it's not that way in the kingdom of God. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, which paradigm are we living in? The one of scarcity or the one of abundance? So I'm going to conclude now. For those of you ready to run away. <clears throat> and I just want to encourage you as we come to these stories that it's so easy to identify with the likable characters, right? We can see ourselves, oh, people slander me too, or I've been wrongfully fired, or I live paycheck to paycheck as well, or, I've suffered so much in this life, or um, look what I've given up for the Lord, um, I'm not like that rich man over there. But I really think that the point of these stories is that we would see ourselves honestly as the rich man. Uh, the rich man who slips into performance-based acceptance, or whose idols include his appearance, or his possessions, or his personal comfort. The rich man who boasts in this life about his spirituality. You know, you have the right doctrine, the right tradition, the right spiritual group, the big gift letter at the end of the year. But do you have faith? Is what we need to ask ourselves. The secret to avoid being the rich man is being willing to identify with your weaknesses and your vulnerabilities and allow these stories to provoke you to come into a place of repentance and change. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and how it speaks right into our heart 2,000 years later or even more. And Lord, we want to catch what you're teaching. We want to receive uh, your instruction for our life. And we certainly want to grow up and mature into uh, the calling and the person that you've created us to be. So Father, I pray that we could be um, honest, um, just like me who walked away from an opportunity today and um, uh, just desire to do better. Lord, just put that desire in our heart to be better and to do better and to be a more reflection of who you are in us. Lord, your spirit dwells in us and I just pray, Lord, that uh, your spirit would work in us and do a deep work and then work through us and touch this world around us. We love you, Lord, but we also need you. We cannot do this alone. And we know that you are with us. And we lay hold of that today. In Jesus' name, amen. John, if you could stay up. Um, some of us, me for example, are a bit slow. And we don't always understand the 100 crown, 200 crown giveaway thing. 
I was wondering if you could explain that uh, one more time sure. and people would have a chance still to, to participate. Okay, so I'm offering you 100 crowns as a gift to you conditionally if you will match it with at least 100 crowns of your money and you will give it away this week. Okay, and where you give it is just between you and the Lord. But I'm s <laughs> by next Sunday, and I just ask that you you pray and give God a you know opportunity in this, you know, Lord, direct me or whatever, and just give it away. Two hundred crowns at least, exactly. And I hope there was enough hundred crown bills to go around. If not, I'll dig through my pockets. But okay, we have an announcement. Okay. So hi guys. Uh, so for the ghost, if you guys who don't know me yet, I'm kind of new here, but my name is Henry, and uh, I'm with the missions organization Steiger, and we do creative evangelism here in this city. And actually today we'll be doing an outreach um, at Vaclav Skanamisti. Uh, we're going to meet at Mustag in front of the New Yorker. And yeah, we're just going to be there as a group. And we're going to do outreaches like this where we basically ask people what is love to them. And we invite people to write down with chalk also what they think love is. And we start a conversation with them about, about the gospel. Um, so I would just like to encourage any of you who have been wanting to kind of know more about how to do outreach or how to share the gospel, just encourage you guys to come. Uh, and you don't even have to actively do it in the beginning if you are a bit shy or worried. You can just go with us and see how to do it. But the main goal, or pray, yes, exactly, That's, which is even more vital, yeah. Um, but the goal, yeah, is to, to encourage one another to, to go reach the people here in, in in, in Prague. So 2.30 uh, in front of the New Yorker and Mustek if you're interested. If you have any questions come and ask me as well. Yeah. Okay. And one more announcement. Leadership team is going to have a hopefully shorter meeting over in the Sunday school room today and we hope to be done within one hour. Okay, before you run away, if you want to spend some fellowship time with the people around you, people here in the church, um, after the benediction, you are invited to go out here where I think there's still some coffee and tea and water and, and just hang out for a while and maybe even consider finding somebody that you can take to lunch or go to lunch with and continue the, the fellowship with some food fellowship. Um, so. I would like the, some home group leaders, uh, people who are used to praying for people who want to come forward for prayer, to come up right now. Okay. And if you would stand for the benediction. There's a bunch of benedictions in the Bible, I think 28, something like that. This one is from Paul from Ephesians 3, verses 17 through 19. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. So at this point, if you would like prayer about any need at all, in confidentiality, of course, please come forward. And the rest of you, uh, enjoy the fellowship. Have lunch together. Have a fantastic week. May God bless you.